Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to Women Word. Q Raptors applause. Raptors applause. Um, my name is Jenny Lindsay. I'm going to be comparing the first part uh, for you uh, today. First of all, just thank you so, 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 so much uh, for coming out to see us uh, this afternoon. A bit of an unexpected uh, PR campaign uh, was, was done for us. Uh, thank you very much to that person. Uh, so, um, <laughs> I was really, really grateful uh, to, to Maggie, who's been my poetry mama and my poetry mentor for so many years, asking me to um, come along and perform today. And I will say, I am quite out of practice, because cancel culture is real, guys. Um, so I do have my book with me in case I forget my words. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to open up just to warm up your ears for a bit of poetry, a bit of words, um, by a sharing poem that I wrote 4,000 years ago in 2018, <laughs> when um, life was a little bit different. And I was very immersed in the Edinburgh literary world, and I was starting to get a little bit disquieted by some of what was going on. Um, and I was looking around and I've been involved in the literary world since I was 20 years old, I'm now 41, and I was like, this is a little bit, dare I say it, exclusionary. Um, and, um, and I was looking at lots of, lots of schisms that were happening within the sort of, particularly the sort of feminist literary world, and I thought, do you know what, I think, I think I know what must be done. Now, I will say, when I wrote this poem, I had had four pina coladas. Um, <laughs> I was in Tenerife, I had so much fun writing this poem. I sat there and I thought, I know what must be done, yes. Because um, don't we all, don't we all at one point go, well, I'm very reasonable. Anyway, so uh, this is a poem about that. And I kind of do stand by it, I'm not going to lie. This poem is called The Schism Ring. There will be cake at the feminist literary gathering, and tea and biscuits, and gluten-free and vegan options, exclamatory sprinkles, <laughs> and safety warnings in case of fire announcements, and formica tables, and ghastly lighting, and a recognition and a catering for everybody covered and uncovered by all topics listed. <sighs> 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 Sometimes, and I admit this, in full knowledge of all of the ways it is problematic, I wish for a banquet of frog's legs, duck eggs, and steak. <laughs> Piles of mashed potato laden with full fat butter and bacon. The setting, a dimly lit cavernous hall, flagons of ridiculously expensive craft ales that we've chored from some dickhead bar. <laughs> and I wish for a big, Fuck off boxing ring, non-lethal, fully accessible, designed for pillow fights to sort out our differences. We'll call it the schism ring. And just as now, a match will be declared. But who cares who wins? Because afterwards we'll devour chicken wings and mozzarella buns smothered in the hottest of hot sauce. We'll get merry on buckets of Malbec and shout, fuck your biological essentialism. Well, <laughs> Well, fuck your gender essentialism. <laughs> and then we'll hug with these different chess and brisk wishing together and at least tacit understanding. If not, love. Folks, are we not bored of angry Twitter sneers and bigot calls and hatred assumptions? Tired of pouty photo selfies and fuck the patriarchy, tote bags and manicured manufactured resistance? Women under 30 calling their older sisters irrelevant witches after all that they have done for us is making me very hungry for a family feast of a reconciliation, not agreement, no. A hearty banquet, though, not some polite, wee, agreeable cupcake. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so, I'm so, so sorry. Do, do you think this is too masculine? <laughs> As I devour meat on the bone with bare hands. Well, I'll not, I'll not, I'll not remember that line. I'll not. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake. I'll not. I will not, I will not use cutlery or wipe my face silent when judged by other criteria from men. 
I'll fill no tick box exercise and do mere purity. Do mere purity is the wrong ingredient. Unless we're after egged face, flan sunk, cakes deflated in the kitchen. So bring your lemon drizzle, your rocky road, your red velvet. Bring your banana bread and marshmallows. And please do, please do call me a misogynist. This verse is dripping with their damn stuff. It's very calorific. And I am one at times. And so are you, because we're fighting a system we are part of, not individual atoms. So bring your ripened, arrogant plum pudge, your nippy wee ginger biscuits, your thirsty tongue, your razor wit sliced into sixes by all things listed. Bring fistfuls of chocolate cookie crusted, melting childhood strawberry ices. Bring your loathing, self and otherwise. Bring your love. Bring your love. Schism ring. It's also open to food fights. Most importantly, all are welcome. Thank you. All right. Woo! Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, our first, uh, our first wild woman up to the stage is Maggie Gibson. As I was saying, Maggie Gibson has been my poetry mama for a long, long time. She is honestly one of the most wonderful poets. She is so generous to other writers. She has won many, many awards. She has fourteen thousand collections. Please welcome to the stage, Maggie Gibson. <laughs> Well, how do I follow that? Uh, th <laughs> thank you, Jenny. That was absolutely fantastic. And that is from Jenny's show, uh, The Script, which hopefully she'll be able to tour again very soon. Um, so do catch the whole show if you can. But it's fantastic you're all here. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't like women who swear he says eyeballing her like a minister from the pulpit. Most unladylike, he opines. You are educated, intelligent, attractive, well able to express yourself in other ways. Fuck off, she says. <laughs> so, uh... Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know my poems off by heart. I never got that clever. <laughs> uh, this is from the book uh, Wild Women of a Certain Age. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can see why I wrote it. And it's called Confessions of a Wild Woman. Dear God, who art in HQ somewhere in America, let me confess the sins which have made me the miserable witch I deserve to be. In my house are many rooms, and it is hard to hoover and clean them all. <laughs> and in a secret cupboard I hoard a Himalaya of ironing, which has been known to avalanche, <laughs> causing danger to life and limb and the temporary loss of one small child. <laughs> but worse than these, oh Lord, I must confess, I own a black and lacy thong and a clingy backless dress. I have long hair and legs and cause men to lust after me, especially if the light is low <laughs> and, and their vision failing. And now, O oh Lord, even with the greying of the hair and the lengthening of the tooth and the lowering of bum and boobs, I get drunk on Saturdays <laughs> and fornicate on Sundays. I hide from the Christian aid woman when she calls for her envelope. I dodge the big issue seller at the corner, but only if I don't have change. I use foul language, but only when sorely pressed or pissed. <laughs> I harbour ill thoughts towards my fellow men, especially those at work. I covet the Diet Coke man in the advert and the young guy at the bus stop, whose shy smile brightens my day 
with heathen and unnatural thoughts. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to water my houseplants and they die. <laughs> Sometimes I overwater my houseplants <laughs> and they die. <laughs> And for these sins, O oh kind and loving God, who is all-powerful, all-seeing and all-forgiving, I deserve no better than to bring forth in sweat and blood and agony and suffering he who now borrows my car without the asking. <laughs> I deserve no better than to be paid a miserable salary for doing a miserable job while trying, still trying to mother the fruits of my sins and somewhere in between sing the praises of he who made me from mud and rib. Ah, so please forgive me, mother and father, who brought me upright. And John Knox, who lurketh like a flasher <laughs> in the shadows of my mind. <laughs> For I have sinned and am not finished yet. <laughs> Now, th this is um, in, in most of it a poetry event, um, so I thought I'd better do a poem that sounds like a poem. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a love poem called Just Like Eve. I could have brought you whiskey to warm you on winter nights, poems full of words to fill your silences. I could have brought you armfuls of flowers to fill your rooms with summer, scented petals to scatter where you dream. I could have brought olives, shiny, black and green, anchovies and parmesan, Chianti, deep blood red. I could have brought figs, dates, kumquats, lychees, tastes to make your senses sing, to set your soul adrift instead. I brought forbidden fruit, the one and only gift you would not accept. Now we hear a lot about uh, inter intersectionality to, uh, these days. I um, am from a working class background in central Scotland. And I went to university, believe it or not, at 16, because they couldn't provide anything at school. There was no sixth year. <laughs> and uh, I went to Glasgow Uni. And at that time, uh, I saw a figure somewhere which said 11% of, of the population, of student population at Glasgow Uni were working class. Within that 11%, I was female at the time in 1970. So you can imagine <laughs> I felt in a minority. Right. Um, an education. Everyone, my ma and dad, my teachers and my gran says I'm a bright wee shite and I should mark them proud and off they send me on my toad to the university. And I learn right enough. I learn I know none. Words come herpling out my mouth, I'll glake it and gawk it. Folk snigger, you're asked your opinion and you're sure you've got one. You used to piss everyone off with all your opinions, but no, no. Your words stick treacly thick in your thrapple, and you're sitting in what they cry a tutorial, but it feels like it's a trial with you in the dock and all the other folk are frowning and nodding and saying, yeah, yeah, in a way that gives you the bulk. <laughs> And they're clasping their notebooks tight, it adds the 20s they think you might mug them for, and wielding their pens like guns. And if you say the wrong thing, you can, they'll shoot you down. In any case, you've learnt. Everything you say is wrong. Survival kicks in. You talk big gulps of their language and their ways. You start to talk the way they talk, and you start to dress the way they dress, and your old mates think you've lost the plot because you still go doing the chippy after tea, only now you call it the chip shop. <laughs> and you can't be there as often because sometimes you stay on at the union for a debate or you meet up with Emma and Sophie for a few drinks and a dash of existential angst. 
then you get this boyfriend and he gives you the inside info on how to pass as native in this foreign land that universities allowed you into. He helps you with the customs and the lingo and even how to laugh so it comes out high-pitched, delicate as a tinkle. <laughs> because he thinks you're unusual, quaint, exotic, and his name is, oh, can you believe it? Tristram. <laughs> And you, says Tristram, are his Isolde. Your pals down the chip shop are suspicious now. You've been outside. An animal separated from the pack, a wild one tamed. They sniff you and growl and forget to tell you where the parties are. Tristram buys you presents, takes you home to meet his parents in Bear's Den. <laughs> you are seduced by his otherness. You wear blouses he chooses, and you simply adore the fine gold chain he nooses round your neck. You bin your too tight jeans, your low-cut tops, your impossibly high heels, and your white trash heritage. You change your name from Lizzie to Beth. You switch from Radio Clyde to Radio 4. From the Daily Record to The Guardian. From cheap white slice to French with curry. From And one morning you wake up and heavens above, you're slipping, slipping? You're sipping Earl Grey from a porcelain cup. Now, you speak inside your head. You think, you reason in the language of the other. Until one day, hooray, you have excelled. Magna cum laude. Well done, you. <laughs> ah, look, another book. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there are some amazing women, uh, both in the UK and in Canada, America, and South America, too, I think, other places who count dead women. And this poem is called Dead Women Count. She counts dead women, not women wiped out in war zones by bullets and bombs, nor the 63 million missing in India. Rita Banjeri is keeping count of them. Nor is she counting the Korean comfort women piecing together what's left of their bones from the fire pits where they perished. No, she keeps count closer to home, but not the victims of wild-eyed strangers they drilled us to evade. Stay with your pals when you leave the pub. Don't walk down darkened lanes. Don't take shortcuts through woods alone. Don't get into vans. Don't wear too short skirts, too high heels, low cut tops. Don't end up a headline, a corpse, a break, a mother's heart statistic in a ditch. No, not just those. She is counting women killed with knives, shotguns, ropes, with septic tanks and fists, with poison, cricket bats and fire, each killed by a man who said he loved her once, a boyfriend, husband, partner, ex, a man she trusted in her home, a man who thought her life no longer counts, but she is counting every week, everyone, and we are counting with her. Um, and these women are doing absolutely marvellous work. Um, it's quite a change in mood for my final poem of this set. And uh, if I, the, the title is got asterisks, asterisks in it, so it's a wee bit hard to say, but so it's V, asterisk, 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 A. Would anyone like to guess <laughs> <laughs> what it is? Hmm. Before she reads... The poet apologises. The next poem has, whisper it softly, a vagina in it. 
And I'm wondering why the utterance of that softly vibrating up front, opening to an eager ah, before that juicily squelching central on its heels that cry of ah, 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 dropping to a moaning and then the grand finale, the climactic, the lip parted gasp of ah would offend. Get a grip, I want to shout. This is the second millennium. We are a poetry audience who must have met the odd vagina before. <laughs> Celebrated in succulent syllables and velvet vowels, opening and closing like sea anemones, eulogized in metaphors of orchids, rosebuds, bearded clams, buzzing bees, serenaded as quivering quims, fuzzy fuds. Giddy gardens of divine delight. Why? Some of us even have our very own discreetly tucked away between our thighs. Yes, right here with us in this hall tonight. <laughs> so here's some advice for all female poets. When you're about to read a poem with a vagina in it, don't be a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Never apologize. Thank you very much. That was, that is Maggie Gibson, her first please. Absolutely wonderful. Now, I did say that I was a wee bit out of practice, and I realised as soon as I sat down, I didn't even tell you how this event is even going to run. Uh, so, I'm going to do that now. So, as you can see, uh, we're going to be doing split sets. So, we've just had a set from Maggie, we've had one poem from me, I'm going to give you three more now, and then I'm going to introduce Elaine Miller, and then we're going to have a break. During that break, you must uh, drink and smoke and flirt and all of those things and buy raffle tickets and buy merch and all that good stuff. And that break will be about 15, 20 minutes. Then we're going to come back with the open mic section that has been managed by Maggie. And then we're going to come back for a final 10 minutes set each from uh, me, Maggie and Elaine. So that's what's going to happen. OK. Yay. Cool. Right. <sighs> On that note, I'm, I'm sort of remembering as I go how this works. Um, right, so I'm going to share with you, um, first of all, um, the title poem from my last show, which was called This Script, um, and it's a show all about sex, gender and feminism. So light subject matter, I thought at the time, uh, no, not really, I was aware that I was maybe going to be wading into some sort of murky waters, and I thought, well, how can I make that even harder for myself? And a friend of mine, the poet Luke Wright, um, told me about this type of poetry called univocal poetry, where within a poem, you limit yourself to using just one vowel in the entire poem. So this script is obviously I. So I thought, well, why not do that? That sounds like a really insane challenge to set yourself. Now, you will notice I am a performance poet, and performance poets are lazy, right? We are very, very lazy. And uh, so uh, this is a part univocal poem, but uh, it does break the rules on purpose, okay? Don't be the guy who comes up and tells me, you do know that there's some other vowels in there? Yes, I fucking do, I fucking wrote it, didn't I? Anyway, this is called This Script, a part univocal poem in and about I. Since six, it imprints in skin. This girl script, this birthright, which kills spirit. Whilst timid lips twitch, shh, girls swirl mildly within this. Eyes itch in this skin, in this script. Misfits spit, kill this, whip nit wit stingingly with livid rifts. This script stinks. It is shirt lifts, its skirt shims with impish grins. It is slits, pink bikini tits, its pricks infringing with victim scripts. It is in birth till infirm. This script, this girlish mimicry. Grim risk if girls wish trim bits within nicks if thigh ripping thick skins and big biff shirts bits binding within rigid distinct ticks ID with scriptish wish list is inspiring. Pfft! It binds eye within slim picking, piddling limits. Misfits, flick digits, fists twitch, indignity fizzing, sighs rising. Cause I 
girl? Is it implicit? Is it ID? This insipid script, is it simply right? Writ in birth, identity, cis? Is this misprint? Kick it, stick it in bins brimming with skin flicks, high five other eyes, let a collective eye light up within winning shin kickings. Bitches, reclaim this script, be singing one is not born, one becomes woman. Oops, off script. Because it's illicit thinking, skirting kinship with siblings, folks hissing in dignity with an ism, splits ID from eyes, schisms rip, twittering videos, timid girls, flit signs, skirmish, irk, pitching in his visibility, crisis rid, shh, shh, kick it. This script is I ridden, I is limiting, I is I first. Tight that wiring gives wind chill, we are not this script. Though we acted well and with vim, I stand still individual while a collective head ricks necks to listen. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Now, now, once again, I am a performance poet and it is actually mandatory as a performance poet to have a really, really angry poem <laughs> about your ex. So that is my next poem for you. <clears throat> or maybe not. This is called The Truth. I miss the comfort. I miss Sunday lunch. I miss your pleasantly plump euphemisms for my butt. I miss your record collection. I miss playing chess in black bows. I miss a critical, honest ear for all of my poems. How's this one going? I miss your parents. I miss you and me. I miss sitting, holding the world to rights in some ramshackle pub down Leith. Oh, I miss your hangover breakfasts. I miss sci-fi vegging in three series of Battlestar Galactica and not feeling guilty about it in the slightest. I miss the day we got the cat and not the day I did. Cat misses you. I miss having so many socks. I miss stealing your socks and that chihuahua look you would get when irritated. <laughs> you left me for the world. <laughs> what competition. I miss your socks. I miss you. Thanks. Oh. <sighs> Don't worry, uh, there's plenty that I didn't miss, but it ruined the poem. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I was going to perch on this bar stool for this next, for my final poem of this set, because I usually do in my show, but I am worried I might flash you. And I think our final act is, is better at, <laughs> at doing that kind of thing. <laughs> I shall perch a little bit. But anyway, so following on from talking about relationships, uh, had quite a little, oh God, this discriminates against short arses, right? Come on. Um, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna stand like this as if it's on purpose. Actually, this, this is just gonna be annoying. Pretend I'm sitting. <laughs> Pretend I'm sitting on a bar stool looking like I'm on a date. Because this uh, final poem I'm gonna do in this set was me imagining a scenario where feminism meets capitalism for a dram. <laughs> I'm here because you asked me politely. You were persuasive and clever to make it seem like my choice. But don't think for a second that I don't know what you're up to. We've been doing this dance for years now, after all. <clears throat> yes. I saw the This Is What A Feminist Looks Like t-shirt marketing campaign and those Dove adverts. Nice one. Grudgingly, I see what you did there, chum. But the touchable, fuckable, rapeable, cunting sight of this is still unknown to you. And my tongue is a dumb slug trying to sip this pink drink you've ordered me. I, I thought we were meeting for a dram. 
Aye, I, I know that the Ladette marketing campaign is now so yester century and you're keener now in the simpering pretty box tick and the strong and androgynous box tick and the boxy tick, boxy tick. You're such an individual boxy tick, but to be quite frank, pal, I'm not so sure that's going to stick. Because the touchable, fuckable, rapeable, cunting sight of this is still unknown to you. Though yes, <laughs> on the surface, some of these choices you offer are quite pretty. But the touchable, fuckable, rapeable, cunting sight of this is still unknown to you. Though, sometimes I want it very much. I mean, I, I want to be beautiful. <laughs> I want to be loved. I want to want you but not want you later. I want to want you, but not be wanted back. I want you to want me, but not know I might need you, because this is crap, pal. This is crap. And I know, and you know, that I will take you home tonight, and I will fuck you like there's cameras. And yet our bodies, they'll not converse. Because the touchable, fuckable, rapeable, cunting sight of this is still unknown to you. Listen, you know this. You knew this before you even invited me here to this bar. You have known me for years and you know how I have known the panting ache of another's absence, the splits and the schisms that have writ in my heart. And I have longed for the tangy wrap of familiarity in a shared bed, though special and separate, our limbs all intersecting to one fine and beautiful mess of hope, <laughs> of liberation. But I find myself forgetting this now with my damp, dumb tongue and my increasing solitude that you made for me. A caged heart so cautious to beat its truth, it's now breaking itself. I have paid you with my fangs, my love, my body, my language, my time. And cleverly, you made it seem like my choice. The touchable, fuckable, rapeable, cunting sight of this is still unknown to you. So I think it's only fair that tonight it's your round, <laughs> my gentle man. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you very much. All right, are we ready for the final act of this first third? Yes. That wasn't very good, children. Um, are we, are we, um, so she almost needs no introduction whatsoever, but I will give her a very, very short one. Um, Elaine Miller, obviously, is, is well known as a fanny physio, as an award-winning comedian, and also as a Merkin flasher. And um, please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Elaine Miller. An amateur. Thanks for having me. I'm kind of disappointed by the start of this though, because I was really expecting to get the opportunity to suck a lady dick. <laughs> it's the only reason I turn up to this stuff. They keep promising me. <sighs> Women keep their promises. <laughs> right. He isn't one though. Um, a mum. You'll be able to tell that from the air of complete satisfaction <laughs> that I have oozing out of me. It's so fucking satisfied. <sighs> there ain't no hood like the motherhood. <laughs> I have liked it. Like, I liked it when they were little, the boys. You know, they were, they were cute, curly-haired and fat-cheeked and just wee tummies that you could go... Pfft on and they giggled and I thought this is fucking magic I loved it they were good as well they were easy to parent you know they responded well to the Scottish traditional way of parenting which is threaten with violence bribe with sweeties it worked a treat <laughs> there was none of that super nanny shite in my house you know where everybody's a, a winner no 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 it, it was it worked brilliantly but my previously cute adorable just lovely lovely can I marry you when I grow up? <laughs> no, no. You should marry for money, darling. <laughs> 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 
They're bigger now, right? They're hulking, great, hairy, jaggy teenagers. Oh my God, how things change. For a start, Lynx Africa enters into your life in a way, in a way that you did not anticipate. And it kind of took me by surprise. The first time I held my son's hand and it was bigger than mine, I thought, oh, that was it. It was done. Turned into a man and I never even noticed. And now I've got some serious fucking parenting to do because you're not leaving my house with that attitude for some woman to fix. <laughs> no. -uh -uh. Both of my sons appear to be straight. That's probably quite significant here, but you never know. Um, all mothers of teenagers develop an understanding of why animals eat their young. <laughs> When did you turn into a dickhead, son? When did that happen? <laughs> Fucking hell. So, given that they appear to be heterosexual, I'm like, going for the kill, because I do not want to have one day, perhaps, a daughter-in-law as complaining as I have been, like, through her gritted teeth at my mother-in-law, who's a lovely, lovely woman, and she sincerely did her best. Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> They came in saying that they did sex ed at school. And all I can say is, things have changed since I was a lad. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Previously, then, a fungus was something that you grew in a Petri dish and invented penicillin. But now it seems to be a thing that grows in your willy and you take penicillin to cure it. Like, sex has got really dangerous. And I have spent a lot of time turning these two cute, adorable wee boys into fine young men, and I don't want them getting the clap. <laughs> so I decided that my approach would be to be a liberal mother, and I would tell them all about my sex life, because <laughs> nothing your mammy does is cool. It'll work, right? So breakfast time, which when you're 17 is apparently one in the fucking afternoon. <laughs> Did I just get heckled by the mic? <laughs> he comes down for his breakfast and I say, oh, son, son, go and, uh, go and talk to your dad. And he went, oh, mum, not this again. <laughs> no, honestly, you need to have that information because, see, last night, I think your daddy learned how to breathe through his ears. <laughs> and if you get yourself a bird, she is going to want you to be able to do that magic. <laughs> Go and talk to your dad. Go and talk to him, son. Learn the ways from the master. I'm just thinking what my husband will say if he knew I was saying this on stage. Never mind, steady. Where's Marion? The boy says, Oh, Mum, no. Enough. Make it stop. And I said, Now, <laughs> I, like, I think I managed to get a whole year's worth of virginity out of that, all on its own. Just <laughs> fucking put them off. It was brilliant. However, it turns out that time and testosterone wait for no ma'am. And the older one's now in love with some wee lassie met at Freshers Week. And it's all very lovely. It's all very smiley and giggly and honestly. One blowjob from a girl barely out of braces and he's in love. <laughs> Fucking hell. And she's nice, but I have spent years and years with five bits of fruit and veg a day. That fucking cost me. I had to whoosh it up in the... <laughs> like that. <laughs> you know when you make spag ball and you hide fruit and veg in it because otherwise they won't... Right, I've done all that. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Disclosing tablets. Brush your teeth. Shame and... F like, brush your fucking teeth. I'm not having some wee girl give him gonorrhea because she's a manky wee bint and ruining it all. Do you know what I mean? 
So I thought what I need to do is knit him a wee bag to keep his condoms in. Because then he'll no get the clap. Good mum. So I did. Now, I'm not an idiot, right? I've gone for a Freudian approach. It's, um, it's called the Snatchel. It's, um, it's got, like, it's like a female reproductive tract. Right, you get it, right? So the basic message is, Do you want some of that, boy? <laughs> well, get yourself one of these, or you'll get one of these. <laughs> I can really knit, eh? <laughs> Fucking works. I've not been down that clap clinic yet. Bloody brilliant. <laughs> so, apart from being, you know, effective, the Snatchel is a feat of knitterly engineering. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, um, it's knitted in the round. Four needles. It's quite good, yeah, I know. You don't want a seam up your uterus, do you? That's not comfy. You don't want that. And um, as you can see, it has a thick and full minge. Yes, now this is a political statement on my part <laughs> because I have seen my son's porn, right, and there's some fucking outbreak of pubic alopecia out there. <laughs> I don't know why, but we need to be able to save the fluff. And I said to them, do you know what, darling, I think I, think I could be like the person with the vaccine because I'm immune. <laughs> got plenty, I can do donations. Um, <laughs> they didn't like that either. I know that I'm, I know that I'm getting, you know, a bit jaded when it comes to porn, when I look at this nonsense and I think, that's a really nice bedside cabinet. How <laughs> will he get that stain out of those sheets? Those look like really good Egyptian cotton. I'm, I don't think they should be doing that. It's not, it's not my thing. Do you know what I mean? As you get older, you begin to think, fuck, I can't be arsed with that shit anymore. I did, I did that to you once and you married me. <laughs> I'm not bothering anymore. So my bikini line is sort of, you know, out of control. And I wasn't fussed about it until I went swimming the other week and there was a wee girl who was only about three and um, she mistook my inner thigh for the gruffalo coming to get her. <laughs> I thought, ooh, maybe I'm up, like, you know, stressing the children. I should have a wee tidy up round about the edges. Um, so I think what I'm going to do with this you know, really effective parenting is develop it into sex ed. And I'm going to go into schools and I'm going to explain to these young men how to handle, because you don't get a map. Like, we just expect them to be good at it. And all they've got to do is learn from porn, and it's not really very realistic. So I'll say, look, most women come with quite, you know, a ring of, of fluff, and all you do is that. Like, just push it out the way. It's not difficult. <laughs> Buy yourself a Kirby grip, darling. <laughs> if you're invested in this relationship, just do that. It's not hard. Shut up. <laughs> And I've got some flappy bits here. Now, these are um, crochet. That's not knitted. I'm bi-stitchable. And, <laughs> and um, I have a wee clitoris here. I know. Which is sparkly. So it's easy to find under the lights. And most of my life is, you know, now fairly focused on teaching men folks where this thing is. Because it's just there. It doesn't move. There is word about phoning the social services at breakfast time, which is at lunchtime, with like, could you stop talking about it? Like, but son, it doesn't migrate around our body. It's not like you don't have to play hide and seek. It's just right there.
My name's Elaine Miller, and the fact that my sons have applied to university in a foreign country has got nothing to do with this. Good afternoon. That was Elaine Miller. More applause. Right. Uh, this, this next one, I'm going to attempt to do another univocal for you. Um, see, here we are. Now, the univocals, as we remember, are, um, are uh, where you limit, you limit yourself to using only one vowel. And with this one, which is called Gender Me, it's actually a bit of a mix. It starts off in E, then it goes to O, and then it combines the two, because I am that sad. So, um, as I said, I was writing about sex, gender, and uh, feminism for my last show, and I challenged myself to write the five univocals. So this is one um, that I don't usually do, actually, on its own, um, because it forms part of the scene from the theatre show. But maybe it'll give you a little bit of an appetite for seeing the full theatre show, should I ever find theatres with vertebrae. Right, um, this is called Gender Me. Gender me, endlessly. Tell me, be she, meekly, keep sh be sweet, never depress, men's feel, centre them, endlessly. Gender me, sexy. Few extremes exempt here, send me sex texts, bends me endlessly, he, knees, eyes, deplete cheeks. Clench here, flex here, bend. Sexy. Eek. <laughs> Gender me. Genteel. Prevent self-serve. Deter depth. Get me green-eyed. Wet in me green-eyed. Weep. 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 Stew me. Sleek. Speck her speech. Extreme gender. Sends he men. Helter skelter. She. Endlessly lesser. Feeble. Gender blend. These messes. Sweet. Keep me femme fresh, helpless shell, blended essence present, remember self-esteem. Gender blend served. Gender blend serves. Serves who? Well. Well, go on. Chop chop, who storms to top jobs, stronghold from shop floor to prof, poo poos, non conform, trollops, spoons, orthodox plonk on wombs, top dog throng, odds on not snowdrops or sows. No, strong wolf, pump pump, old school plots for now, from good book to cold blood, common rooms to crowds, from boys to dogs, bulk boss who holds jobs for so so boys, scorns good work from dolls, prowls, swoons, drools on hot blossom bosoms, looks down on old for no worth, hmm? No. Doll, don't confront too gobby, no. Go coo, comfort, don't confront. Crooks don't go down, dolls do, thrown down, don't we. Gender me, secrets kept restlessly, then me too. Two word, two vowel combo, more power to elbows. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm flapping like a poet who's had two glasses of wine. <laughs> right, what was I going to do now? Right, I'm going to finish up with Imagined We. What was it? Oh, yes, now, this is something that, um, this is actually Maggie, this is one of Maggie's favourite poems of mine, so I'm going to do it for her. Um, it's something that's not, um, it's not written about um, all that often, but it's about like friendship breakups, like when you've got a really, really close female friendship um, and then it just goes absolutely like platonic and everything, but it goes south. Um, and that can be really difficult. And we, I, I think we don't talk about it enough. Um, and Maggie was my editor for this book. And then um, this was one of her favourites. So I'm going to I'm gonna share it with you. It's called Lighter. Just a little poem. Being with her was like a game, a candle between us on the table. The trick to quick swish an index finger through the flame. And this led to laughter, 
cries of, do it again, do it again. Sometimes, oh yeah, bastard. A game infectious, her encouragement risky, selfish, addictive, but it never lasted. Sometimes I find myself staring at an unlit stub. Sometimes, too many times, she disregarded the safe word, held my palm in till it blistered. Eventually, too much knocking over of the bastard thing in my direction, I'd schlep home, morosely picking wax off yet another formerly favourite cardigan. There is regret in this as I eye the wax-stained table because at times we made good light. But sometimes that kind of love will burn you and your fucking house down till there's nothing left to consume. So, that Tuesday, I left the matches at home. She'd stolen my lighter, of course, <laughs> but it wasn't working for her anymore. Thank you. <clears throat> now, I am going to finish up with a poem that did start life as a poem and then became a song, um, which you can watch online, uh, called The Imagined We. Because I wrote this poem, as it was, a week before uh, the Me Too campaign in 2017. And it was about the double-edged sword of being a woman <laughs> and sharing your trauma and what happens when you do and how people treat it and how you treat it yourself. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it is now a song, so I don't know how this is going to go. I'm going to have to play the music in the back of my head um, while I do this one. But um, there were a few different things that were going on um, before um, the Me Too thing that were really concerning me about how women were you know, being encouraged to bleed on stage and then were getting treated really, really badly about it. And there was also this huge discussion about uh, women-only awards and how they're not necessary anymore. And I have thoughts on that. So, um, this is called The Imagined We. We are never permitted to be human poets, writers, journalists, whatever. We are women poets, female writers. We are murdered women. We are statistics. We are problems to be solved. We are problems to be represented. Each of the imagined we rises up and becomes us, whether we like it or not. Do not tear them down, sisters. Do not tear them down, women folk. It is not womanly of us to be at each other's throats, not when they are our throats, not when sirens are the soundtrack to our news feeds. Or we're slashed at the throat, we're severed heads weighed down with rocks, heads shucked far from our body, our humanity chucked off by default humans' hands. We stand in the shower. Our blood trickles down our thighs. On one of those days, one of those days, one of those days where we're encouraged me time, me time, me time, alone with bubble bath, alone with yummy bubble baths in delicious flavours. Misogyny mud pie and mint. Creamy, dreamy cum dumpster froth. <laughs> Raspberry coolie and cool aid. Mm. Pedo pear with jojoba and argan oil. Lollipop. We plug it in all holes, don't we? We lean our heads on the tiles and watch our blood plop and pull because a plug hole is blocked. And we imagine that an epic car chase followed by fistfights led us here to this bleeding from a hidden wound and that we are renegades, we are superheroes or perhaps functioning drunk anti-heroes but we have trauma in our past and we are setting things right. The imagined them, the bad guys, have been left in pools of bleeding regret. Some of them have wooden stakes sticking out where their hearts once were. Some of them turned to dust in front of our eyes and were bruised. We are injured, but we are alive. We are just temporarily crunched over, <sighs> tenderized, bleeding from the fight. This script writes itself, plop, plop, plops, in our silence. Picture the scene, 
Strings rise up, are soon accompanied by brass as the camera angle switches from our point of view. It starts at polished toenails that sparkle through our bloodied feet. It pans up smoothly at the same speed as that constant little trickle. The lens ensures a glimpse of our shaved mound. There's a slowing at unsuckled nipple. And then our face, our face in tight-lipped defiance, closed-eyed anger, and then a sudden snapping open, clearly fierce pain inside. The scene ends with our fists punching and then pummeling, the tiles, our strangled throats expleting, our knuckles bloodied too now, all this fucking pain, at which an audience will cry, Bravo! What fighting spirit, triumph over adversity, all those banished demons. And the removal of awards, rewards limited to a fist, smashing another fist and being told it's the fight against us, or what makes us who we are. And then we must love the pain of this at all costs. But we must love the pain of this at all costs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Okay, I'm going to go and get more drunk now. Right, okay, uh, we now are going to have the second set from the absolutely wonderful, award-winning, amazing Amazon, Maggie Gibson. Welcome her to the stage. Whoa, well, I'm still catching my breath, and I wasn't even performing. <laughs> uh, so, a perfect wife. A perfect wife has clean fingernails, keeps a clean house, makes a creaseless bed, lies in it happily, even when he doesn't. A perfect wife never answers first back correctly. A perfect wife conceives at the drop of a hat, blooms when she is with child, delivers daintily a perfect son. A perfect wife breastfeeds discreetly, does not squirt milk when making love, feigns ignorance on premature ejaculation, vaginal irritation, and most especially, clitoral stimulation. A perfect wife is secure enough to say, I am not a feminist, in a non-confrontational, fragrant, feminine way. A perfect wife is flexible, will bend over backwards, position 252, to please her husband. A perfect wife smiles when doors are open for her, does not see doors slammed in her face, thinks the glass ceiling is an architectural innovation. A perfect wife comes quietly. In sizes 10 and 12, a perfect wife has a perfect wife punched out on her back. A perfect wife is a registered trademark, available only while stocks last. <laughs> I think we're completely out of stock in this basement. <laughs> Uh, this poem, uh, when I was at the surrogacy event in here, uh, run by Glasgow Saxophone Feminists a couple of weeks ago, um, this poem that I wrote quite some time ago kept coming back to me. It's called, Shh. They found me in the corner, way at the back of my mother's wardrobe. At first, they thought I was a button broken loose from a frayed thread, or a mothball, happy in the dark. Then, as, as I grew, they thought I was a shoe without a partner, but they were busy folk. It was easier to poke me back beside the fallen jumpers and the missing socks. As for me, I was quite content, tucked up in the folds of mother's frocks. From time to time, she'd drag me out, wear me, 
dangled prettily on the end of her arm, the ultimate accessory, a quiet daughter. <laughs> and not all uh, little girls are happy to be quiet or have such easy, easy times of it. This poem was written after a judge in England uh, in a rape trial where the girl had been raped by her babysitter, brought up the child's past and said she was no angel. She was nine and half her milk teeth gone because she'd kissed the boys behind the shed and she listened in on big girl, bad girl jokes and laughed and laughed until she wet her knickers. Though she never understood what was so funny, she was only nine, but already knew the ins and outs of sexual intercourse. They'd done it in class with Miss Jones and she'd seen it on the telly a million times, though she never looked, not really, just pretended while she counted the leaves on the weeping fig. And she might well have known a condom if she'd met one in the street. And it cannot be denied she'd played kiss, kick, torture and enjoyed it. And snogged Jamie from the high school for 10 minutes under the shoe without taking a breath. With three independent witnesses. So it shouldn't have surprised you, not really when her past was revealed in court and the judge with all the wisdom of his wig, the judge with all the gravity of his gown, revealed that the victim, the nine-year-old victim of the sex attack, was no angel. Um, and I, I've... When we did the workshop a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were, I think adult human female had just been stopped from, from being shown. And there was such anger. I was picking up such anger in the room. And this poem is called Rage. I don't know why I keep listening to the news. I don't know why my neighbours want to destroy the lush green lindens where baby, baby birds are nesting. I don't know why I never turned into a decent housewife, but I'm not, though I'm proud of my shelves stacked with books. I don't know why I'm allergic to house dust when my home is knee deep in the stuff and allergic to pollen when I love trees. I suspect God's a bastard and thinks it's a joke. I don't know why they push refugees back into the Mediterranean at midnight and think we won't care why they lock migrant children up in the Texan desert, lonely and scared, and call it Camp Bliss. Why they pollute the air and pretend it's okay because it's all carbon offset. I mean, what the fuck? I don't know why we have the most corrupt government of my lifetime who talk democracy but refuse to listen, who put rapists' rights before those of women. I don't know why we have such wretched poverty in a world that's so rich, but I do know this. I love how each year ragged skins of geese appear honking loudly in the winter sky. How one single human hair is a strong a steel, how being near you makes me feel. I don't know why I find it hard to write these days, but I guess I'm scared of so much rage at those with the power of fucking us over. And I do know enough about long dormant volcanoes that it's best, seriously, it's best that they don't erupt. <laughs> Oh, I think I need to calm down after that. <laughs> uh, and of course, in the past, we were told uh, uh, that uh, women's anger is not pretty. You know, with no right to it. Um, no, pretty. Oh, it's not valid. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to to the man over there. <laughs> And we are really, really pleased. We're really pleased to see that there are some men here uh, supporting us today. But uh, we talked about generational before women were reading poems. And this is um, one of the poems about my mum that I have. And in any case, I've got to read it because she is dead. 
but it'll get to her and she'll put a hex on me. So uh, every time I do a reading anywhere, I've got to do one for my mum. Mum, this is it. <laughs> Old clays and porridge. Don't pick the flowers, you always said when I was small. It's such a waste. They last much longer in the ground. Keep good clothes good. I hung around in seconds, slightly soiled, in fire sale clothes and hand-me-downs, waiting for the high days and holidays and flying pigs and blue moons so I could get the chance to choose the pretty pinifer, to don the frothy party dress, to dance till dawn in shiny patent shoes. Waste not, want not, mend and make do. On winter nights... You'd patiently unravel the sleeves of jumpers, knit them back, cut out the thin, frayed yarn. Often, you took two tattered sheets and stitched one new. Close to 80 now, you stick to old, tri to old tricks, to old clays and porridge. So, when death unravels you, I'll inherit... Cupboards full of virgin linen, bales of pastel towels wrapped in dusty cellophane, thirty suits and forty frocks and fifty shoes like new. I'll dress you then in a pale silk gown, six thousand silkworms dyed to spin. I'll gently comb your hair, I'll set your finest hat upon your head, your finest string of pearls around your neck and on your grave. I'll leave armfuls of cut flowers. Um, I was getting a bit emotional myself there at the end. <laughs> it's, it's funny how that uh, happens to you. Oops, I think I've got that. Wrong book. <laughs> That's twice I've done that today. Uh, like Jenny, I'm a bit out of practice, although you wouldn't know Jenny was out of practice. <laughs> Think she had been doing her show just last week. And it is a brilliant show, and she is looking for uh, venues to do it. So uh, if you hear of any of day that would be willing to have Jenny for one hour, one woman show, yes. yep, then pass them on to her. Uh, one of the things you do as a poet is that you observe, and it's one of the reasons I think that women writing is so uh, necessary and so important, because we, we, we bear witness. And because I'm a woman, I kind of look quite a lot at what's happening around me with women. This poem's called Three Days Till Christmas. In the packed department store, shoppers laden like Sherpas trek through forests of synthetic trees, wade through drifts of special offers. In the midst of this throng, under twinkling tinfoil stars, she wanders alone, on sandaled feet, donkey brown coat, buttoned up all wrong, perched upon her unbrushed hair, a crown of tinsel thorn. Crowds part before her, like a Red Sea miracle, she floats by on a cloud of cheap whiskey, while her voice soars above the festive ringing of cash registers, a fallen angel singing in the bleak midwinter. Back to the noisy book again. Uh, right, uh, why is it some men cannot see a woman in a pub sitting alone drinking without coming over to speak to you? <laughs> and uh, this was actually written in the Clues of Vaults. I'd arrived uh, early. There was a poetry thing on later in the evening and I was waiting for my female friend to arrive. And uh, this guy obviously thought I was just wanting him to come over. <laughs> <laughs> So it's called a uh, fruit machine. I wink at the fruit machine. It winks back, orange, red, green, while I sit drinking long, cool glasses of iced loneliness. The guy in the corner thinks I'm winking at him, 
Over he ambles, one hand clutching a half-drunk pint, the other jingling pennies in his pocket, as if he thinks I'm easy, oh, it's a wain, a wedding, waiting for the scramble. <laughs> I do not return his hot, hungry glance. I'm staring at the fruit machine. The man has not a chance. <laughs> Coldness floods from me, tangible as the cold from an open freezer door, and he's a fool in a short-sleeved shirt trudging through the tundra of my glower. <laughs> so what does he do? Slides between me and my machine, stands legs akimbo, thrusts his groin against its metal hips, slips a coin between its metal lips, presses the right buttons and suddenly it's orgasmic, flashing and wailing and screaming out for more. <laughs> if only women were so simple, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if he had uh, attended one of uh, Elaine's shows, <laughs> he would have known better. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to finish on uh, the title poem of this book, Wild Women of a Certain Age. And thank you, you have sold out on Wild Women of a Certain Age today. Uh, very much appreciate that. Wild Women. Oh, there is still a poster just before. Stop. <laughs> Wild Women of a Certain Age. My sisters, the time has come to let your hair grow long and wild and grey, to cast away the heated rollers and the tongs. So when the moon is nine months full, let us meet out on our lawns, let us burn our diet sheets, let us pound our bathroom scales to heaps of rusting springs. <laughs> Let us shred our measuring tapes, our firmer buttocks, DVDs. Let us burn an effigy of Cher. Let us tip. <laughs> <laughs> Let us tip our eye, eye creams. I nearly said ice cream. <laughs> Cher doesn't eat ice cream. Let us tip our eye creams down the pan. Let us revel in our pink, plump ripeness. Let us wear our stretch marks like shining honours. Let us celebrate ourselves because we can. For we have bodies that have loved. We have bodies that have lived, mouths that have savoured cheese and meat and dribbled over chocolate and fruit. Tongues that have tasted good and evil. Lips that have sipped fine wines, fingers that have stroked. We have been the carriers of babes. Our bellies have swollen with drumlin curves. Our breasts have hung like ripened fruit. Our teeth have bitten skin and threads. We have swallowed bitter pills. We have known dark bloodstains on our hands. We have been the carriers of laughter and of pain, the healers of our children's ills. We have lain below the stars, we have lain below our men. Yes, sisters, now the time has come to claim our bodies for ourselves, for in our silver hair, our well-filled thighs, in those laughter lines that crowd our eyes, we live, we are alive. Thank you very much. That was, that is Mikey Gibson. More applause, please. All righty. So we have reached the final act, the final set um, from our uh, Women Word event. Um, at this point, could I please ask you all to do a very, very unscottish thing? I would like you to give a huge round of applause to yourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you so, so much. Um, now, I'm going to get out of your face and I'm going to welcome uh, somebody who's going to get it right up you. Um, please put your hands together and welcome to the stage for the final set, Elaine Miller. I think I'm getting typecast. <laughs> Um, don't tell me that about the tax. I went and married a tax lawyer. <laughs> I did too. I've known him to go and speak to people busking in the street and saying, are you paying tax on that? <laughs> hell. 
man's got a passion for tax. We're very different people. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, um, Jenny. And I'd like to second, you guys are a great audience. Like, it's just so much fun. Thanks for coming. We're going to do this every week because it's brilliant. Um, now, because it's women's word and it was poetry, I thought, oh, God, I better write some poetry. I don't know anything about poetry. So I didn't let that stop me. And I wrote... <laughs> I don't know anything about anything apart from fannies. And um, I wrote some poems, right? And then I was reading them in the bus coming over, going, Jesus, it's harder than it looks, isn't it? <laughs> that is shite. <laughs> I can't I can't follow proper actual poets with my rhyming couplets and fart jokes. It's just not going to work. So I had a chuckle to myself in the bus and thought, I could just wing it. Nobody's listening anyway. It'll be fine. And um <laughs> I've just rewritten the whole bloody thing, which is why I've got notes that I can't read. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, it's women word, and women is an important word. And Lord Cormac said in the House of Lords, the, the most favourite word in the English language, they surveyed um, people that English was their second language, and their most favourite word was mother. And it really, I was like, oh... Like, women's words and words about women are really important and they matter. So I was going to write something clever about that and then I got distracted by um, <laughs> colours. And I thought, what? <laughs> what colour would a woman be? Right, spectrum head. head. And um, at the time I was walking <laughs> under some trees. You know, at this time of year, the, the light shines through the green leaves and it's bright, bright green. And it's really lovely. It gets me all excited in May because you're like, oh, look, a whole new year. And you know, I'm feeling philosophical, usually after two or three glasses of wine. And I thought, that green is a woman's colour because it's the exact colour of the pus that came out my tit when I had mastitis. <laughs> mastitis ruined me for me. It's the exact same and it's sore. So I can no longer walk underneath a lime tree and go, oh, look how lovely, and feel inspired, because, ouch, and it was a long time ago, and I think I might have trauma. <laughs> it's the exact bloody colour. So I thought, right, I'm not doing green. I'll do ivory. Right, that's a nice, meaningful shade for a woman. And then I thought, no, that's no good either, because then I got thrush in my tits. <laughs> Who knew that was a thing? Thrush. Yeah, <laughs> all the women that have had it going, oh, you know, awful. Thrushing your tits is worse than mastitis. It is horrific if you've not heard of it. It's what happens when you breastfeed your infant and they've got thrush in their face for no earthly reason at all. They've not gone anywhere. <laughs> they've not even eaten any yogurt. How have you managed to get fungus in your face? This is not on, straight to the naughty corner for you. And because they then suck their fungusy face onto your tit, you get thrush in your tit. <laughs> Being a woman is shite. <laughs> and they open their wee angry purple, there's a colour, purple face, their face becomes 80% mouth. And in it, there's a tiny wee pink ch tongue vibrating. What? How do they do that? How does that happen? That's not humanly possible. I've seen women ululate and they can't do like a newborn that's hungry. And you're looking at the wee pink tongue and it's covered in that sticky white stuff and you're like, oh no. But you're in it anyway because the letdown's happened and it feels like crushed glass coming out your boob. And I knew that because I'd read it in a book because I'm so middle class. I still believe you can learn anything from a book. <laughs> if you want to do something, get yourself a good book. You'll be able to learn all about it. So I'd learned cut glass in your tits. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound very nice. And then it happened and I'm like, it's like you've got crushed glass in your tits. Every two... <sighs> not a fan. Not a fan of breastfeeding. So that's the coloured bit, right? Now, the thing about colours, <laughs> fundamentally, I'm quite a lazy mother, right? I did, I did breastfeed the children, but that was not because of any, you know, <laughs> for their benefit. It was, um, it was because otherwise I would have to sterilise bottles. <laughs> 
not very fashionable to be honest about that, but how was I going to remember to sterilise stuff? I can't even remember. I'm knackered. <laughs> I've only had three hours sleep and about three children. I can't, I can't wash stuff, no. I'll just feed them myself. And um, really, I think that the Scottish Government should be using this as a way of increasing the breastfeeding rates in Scotland because if we told people formula is expensive... And if you feed them yourself, you've got money left over like I did for fags and vodka. It was fucking brilliant. It was brilliant. It was really expensive. Just do it yourself. Grit your teeth and get through the thrush after that. You never leave a bottle behind. Just got your tits with you. Win-win all the way around. So, mm. It made me, though, quite an, an unskilled mum because all I had to offer was... <laughs> Here's a tit in your face. And the, it works, you know, until they're about nine months old. <laughs> Nineteen, they're not, they're not so keen. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine, Mum, it's fine. I'm feeling much better. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's not good. The first time you feed your baby in public, that is weird. And we should be teaching women, preferably in a book, about how to do that because... <laughs> I wasn't looking forward to it, but I knew it was going to have to happen on account of the forgetfulness and the no bottles. Um, so I thought, I'm going to see my mum and dad. I'll do it at my mum and dad's house, because I'm there all afternoon, the baby will need feeding. And um, I thought this was a brilliant plan, until the child turned into an angry gremlin and um, really needed feeding, and my boob was like, a, you know what I would imagine a, a football feels like at kick-off? in a Premier League final. <laughs> Quite hard. How does that happen? It's not humanly possible. And a wee baby's face is all kind of soft, but squished in and bits of it open. So it's quite hard to get them to attach to, you know, a football. And um, <laughs> it was stressful. Socially awkward, because she didn't know what she was doing and I didn't know what I was doing. And my dad's sitting there, my dad. My dad is sitting there and he's, you know, West Coast, of Scot West Coast of Scotland man who would much prefer it if I was still, you know, going to brownies. Because <laughs> that was easier. We, me and my dad had an unspoken agreement that I would pretend to be a virgin even though I'm holding his grandchild. It's fine. And then the kid's struggling and I'm struggling and he's like, oh my God, she's got breasts. Oh my God, oh my God. And he's looking... He's looking intently at a wall that he hasn't really properly examined in about 22 years when he last put some wallpaper on it. And it is fascinating. It's caught his attention. He's like, that wall is, um, I don't know what's going on over there. I'm going to ignore that wall is, oh, no breasts on that wall. That's a good wall. <laughs> and then he said, Margaret, if we get a drip, Because what the book did not tell me was, when you're attempting to feed the baby with your right breast, the left one joins in. You would think that was an important nugget. It also didn't tell me there's such a thing as a rogue spurter, which can shoot right across the end of the city at such an angle that it hits your father and his bald head and dribbles down his sideburn. Because <laughs> the milk doesn't come out your boob like water out of a tap. It comes out like water out of a shower and nobody told me that. It was socially awkward. <laughs> we, we never spoke of it since. Um, <laughs> So green and cream <laughs> and the white of, of milk dripping. There was no plumbing disaster, so it wasn't all bad. And, um, and red, red is a colour associated with women, the deep Malbec of the glistening clot that just slithered down your leg and landed on the cotton of your bath mat. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you. Like an enemy stranded in a rock pool. <laughs> and you don't know whether to be horrified or quite impressed. How the hell? What is that? Have you ever tried to pick one up? Right? Because you can't leave it there. It's on your bath mat. What if your daddy pops round? 
and you've got Beelzebub's jellyfish stuck to your bat mat. <laughs> you have to move it. Have you ever seen in a book the way to move your giant claw off the... They don't tell you how, and you pick it up, and you know that game that the kids bought with their pocket money? It's like two bits of plastic in a kind of tube thing, and there's liquid in the middle, sometimes with sparkles in it, and they pick it up and it dribbles down like that, and you do that all the... Oh, it's great fun, except for when it's your pear-sized claw out your fanny. <laughs> Splashing everywhere. We should really talk about these things, I think. <laughs> Yeah, still bleeding, 50, carrying tampons, oh yeah. My beard is going white, <laughs> but my hair's not, it's very odd. Um, when I started having periods, it was pads that we got, which were like bricks of cotton. Do you remember, like they're different now that we've got absorbable plastics that are ruining the planet, but originally they were like bricks that made you walk funny. Those, those um, sanitary towels would not have looked out of place in a good premier in bed. You know, guaranteed a good night's sleep in our cosy pillows. They were massive. Ridiculous. But now we've got moon cups. <laughs> I think, I, I love a moon cup, but I do think that it's a ruse that's been invented by the Pilates industry <laughs> to try and make you bendy enough to remove that bloody thing. That's why women are doing yoga, because you have to be able to squat, and it's, it's no easy. It's really <laughs> I got put off tampons, because one time I went and pulled one out, and it just was a bit of string. That wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> such a good pelvic floor, you see. <laughs> nothing, nothing gets out of me without my permission. Do you know, right, see, cause you're a friendly audience, I've got this notion, I'm trying to write a book that probably should put all this stuff in it, right? And what I think we should do for pelvic floor exercises, this is why I'm in so much trouble with my professional peers, but watch that, fuck you. <laughs> right, who's got a Roomba? You know, the wee electric Hoover thing, right? See if you got a wee string on the end of your tampon <laughs> and you left it. And then the Roomba came past and it swept up and you had to stop your tampon from getting shot out on the Roomba. That would make you do your pelvic floor exercises. <laughs> I think I could get sponsorship from Roomba. I think they're quite a big company, you reckon? Yeah. So I was thinking about pads and how they've improved and you can get pads that have got wee purple flowers on them. Have you seen them? They make little pr pretty patterns so it feels feminine. And um, they put Febreze in it as well, so it has an odour control, because you stink. <laughs> the company that does that, that has the odour control pads, they own the chemical that they put into Febreze. It is actually Febreze in your fanny. That's why it makes you itchy. I know, it's outrageous. Anyway, so I thought, let's, instead of, you can put wee purple flowers, let's have some motivational messages on my fanny pad because Christ knows I need cheering up so I've got one here that says do do your pelvic floor exercises right because that would work we could do that for incontinence pads specifically and then I thought what about if we got inspirational quotes and um, this is one of my favorite ones from Martin Luther King <laughs> Honestly, I don't know how I got cancelled. It's a fucking mystery. <laughs> Seriously, keep listening. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Do you know the last person with a public platform that said that? Was Shona Robinson. <laughs> if only she was here. Um... <laughs> On the 22nd of December, 2022, the end of the GRR bill, the last words spoken were from Martin Luther King by Shona Robison. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So I wrote it on a bunch of fanny pads. 
and a bunch of us sent them in to the politicians. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> but I need to update it. No man would pretend to be something he's not. <laughs> you gotta watch though, cause see when you buy your fanny pad to write things on that they've said in red. If it's got wee purple flowers, it's quite hard to read. So if you're, if you're gonna be inclusive, think about people that don't have great vision. Um, Natra care own ones, they come without anything on it. I'm annoyed with that woman. Anyway. <laughs> So it's interesting about the sort of red and white thing and um, blood and milk. And I think that the people that struggle with this are heterosexual men. Um, they struggle with some things. Um, because like they, some men claim to be such sexual beings that if they can't get it, they have to sexually harass some women because they need sex constantly. Or they might die or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if a woman is menstruating or lactating or if she has body hair or if she's wearing, you know, some sensible, comfortable underwear that doesn't go right up your crack or if she has an opinion, then um, <laughs> suddenly they can't get it up and that makes them sad, which is your fault. And um, I mean, it is a wee shame. I'm being flippant. It can really devastate some men. Um, and... and <laughs> You're the bad one I've heard about. <laughs> Some men are sad. <laughs> <laughs> there is five times more funding spent on managing erectile dysfunction than there is on all hormonal issues impacting women, including breastfeeding. Because the willy matters and you don't. Um, and sex is for men, apparently. And that's why the orgasm gap is a feminist issue. Um, there are lesbians in this room. If you're not a lesbian, look around you. See the ones that are looking fucking happy. <laughs> <laughs> They're at the back going, fuck yeah! <laughs> She's had six orgasms since she got in this room. The evidence that sexuality is innate is women like me going, oh God, the boobie. <laughs> Why do I like a boobie? <laughs> there is lots of science proving that heterosexual women are not sexually satisfied. And um, I think we should have some non-violent protest about this. What I'm proposing is that women, all heterosexual women, to sort of make the point, what we do is we suck around the penis. Quite, quite close to the penis, <laughs> just slightly off. <laughs> and you don't quite do it right. You might go a bit like that. <laughs> and then look like you need a wee round of applause. <laughs> Not where you know it needs to be, just slightly to the side. And every time you get a wee nudge with his knee, you just ignore it. <laughs> just crack on, because you're not going that you're just going to insist on. Maybe have a wee enthusiastic rub of his pubic hair for a while. Is that nice, darling? Do you like that, do you? Do that for a long time. Kids are asleep. What difference does it make? Is that? Do you like that? No, I fucking don't know what you're doing. Non-violent protest. In other news, until 2017, in order to buy a vibrator in Sandy Springs, Georgia, America, you had to have a doctor's prescription. Till 2017. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of very unhappy American women. Honestly, see, when I read that, it threw my pH balance right off. Was there a black market? <laughs> Never miss a marketing opportunity. 
Shall we send them? You know how there's all these amazing charities that send the morning after pill out to women in Ireland? Shall we send like pity vibrators out to the American women in Georgia? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in for that. I, you can have my money. <laughs> um, if your lover is unhappy about you having a vibrator, you must dump him. He really should see it as a collaborator and not competition. Silly, <laughs> silly man. Yeah, see what I say, like the lesbian and bi women, they have got the hang of things. No lesbian or bi woman has said to her lover, it's Adam and Eve, Elaine, not Florence and the Machine. <laughs> Dumped. You know that Liz Lockhead quote that I love so much I wrote on the side of my Henry Hoover? Feminism, I'm not even joking, a sharpie. Um, fe <laughs> I take my feminism very seriously, a lot more seriously than I take my hoovering, clearly. <laughs> feminism is like hoovering, you just have to keep doing it. It's good, eh? And bloody true. So here's my favourite, oh God, I meant to take this out. Here's my favourite vibrator which actually has just died and um, I'm kind of hoping that Jenny or Maggie will write it a wee requiem. Um, I wrote Liz Lockhead quote up the side of my hoover. What do you think I wrote in my vibrator? <laughs> Fuck the patriarchy! Fuck that. <laughs> and then it died. <laughs> Might be Shona Robson's fault. Let's just blame her. I think my vibrator died of tiredness. Um, you don't need a vibrator though. When the um, dating website for gay men, Grinder, came out, that confused me slightly. Because <laughs> I thought it was for women that have broken every pillow they've ever bought. <laughs> Welcome, sisters. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a common form of female masturbation that you will not see in any porn because there's none for the men to look at where you just kind of, you know, hump your pillow or your soft toy until it turns into dust. <laughs> it's quite good to get the hang of, ladies, because you never run out of charge. And um, I would recommend it. It works because what you're doing is when you're humping an item, you're pressing the legs of your clitoris against your pubic bone and it's awful good. Now, who's going, what, legs, what? <laughs> right, here is a life-size model of a female clitoris. Quite a big one, I know, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, it's slightly larger than, than uh, my friend got this made for me. Um, it's a 3D pattern, if you Google 3D pattern for clitoris, it'll come up, and you just put it into your 3D printer. He's a technical teacher at the school. <laughs> <laughs> he got his sixth year <laughs> boys to print me a clitoris. He's a good teacher. Um, <laughs> so there's three tickly bit, and then it's got two legs, two go down the side of your labia, and then these two go round your vagina, which means that whatever you pop into your vagina gets a wee hug. And they think that's what your G-spot is, that it's not that you've got, you know, somebody that's really good at yoga. <laughs> or, or maybe a vet. Um, <laughs> trying to find some magic button that when they go, boom, boom, you go, oh my goodness, just like Maggie did in her poem. No, they think that what is happening is you're getting sensation from the inside out and you're doing it all by yourself. <clears throat> It's per fucking usual. <laughs> it's very tickly on your end of your clitoris. This wee bit, the glands bit, is super, super tickly. And if you Google that, then, you know, Google science will tell you that it's got 8,000 nerve endings on the end of it, whereas the bell end of a man's penis has only got four. And that's something we should really tell them in a book. And that's why they get a bit over-enthusiastic. <laughs> If they do find it, they start to treat it like Bear Grylls who's attempting to start a fire. <laughs> Calm down, lad. <laughs> it's tickly. It's the wee tap. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. However, when you look up the... Um the, the research, if you look up the actual paper, the science um, that a psychiatrist did, which is curious, why was he looking at um, clitorises, um, he dissected um, the clitorises of sheep and cows. 
We don't actually know how sensitive a female clitoris is, other than quite. So, <laughs> to help, remember I said I was doing sex ed for my sons. I'm going to show you my prop that I took into their school. I wish I was kidding. I did too. Um, my, my daughter, who has left home and has never come back, um, <laughs> she put a stop to it in the end because it didn't occur to me that that could be embarrassing. <laughs> Oops. So I thought, right, what these young guys need to know is where a clitoris is and what it does and how sensitive it is. So I dressed up. And I said to, you know, fifth and sixth year students, so a vulva is a collection of things, but a vagina is one thing, right? That's useful information. And then um, I said to him, and this is the clitoris, and what we want is none of that. Stop doing that. Do plenty of that. And then I got the lesbians to go and tell them all about it. And it <laughs> worked a treat. Quite frankly, why I'm not in charge of being First Minister, I don't know. <laughs> My name is Elaine Miller. Good night. That was Elaine Miller. More plus, please. <laughs> oh, my God. My cheeks hurt. My cheeks hurt so much. She's absolutely wonderful. Oh, my God. Right, well, oh, my God, that was uh, Women Word. There's a lot of thanks to do before we get on to the very important business of the raffle. Um, but first of all, I just want to mention a little bit of the elephant in the room this evening, which is that it should never be as controversial as it has been to run this event. Yeah. Ever. And, and we must never make it ordinary for it to be controversial to run this event. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much to the supportive venue of Blackfriars and to all of the bar staff. Give them a huge round of applause. Um, massive thanks to Chris and to James for doing sound and film. I would now like, at this point, to invite my uh, co-performers, Maggie Gibson and Elaine Miller, back to the stage, and we're going to get a mutual round of applause for all three of us. Come down to the stage. Ma keep clapping while Maggie's coming down, and Elaine is grabbing something that she's coming down to the stage. And um, could we also please have a huge round of applause to our six or seven, I think, open mic people. Thank you very much.